Where in your life are you avoiding conflict? Could it be at work? Perhaps there's something going on you're not talking about and you're just avoiding it altogether. Could it be at home? Perhaps summer isn't going exactly as you planned or you're planning for the future and things aren't exactly what you want. Wherever you are, if you're avoiding conflict, I want you to lean in today because I have someone who is a card carrying member as a of conflict avoider in their whole life, who is going to show us how to not do that anymore. Sarah Noel Wilson, welcome to Control All Delete with Lisa Dury. I'm so excited to be here, Lisa. And like, let's be very clear, platinum card carrying member. <gasps> platinum. Very, very skilled. Okay, well, let's be serious about conflict very avoidance. <laughs> right? Yes, indeed. Okay, so for longtime listeners, you may recognize Sarah. She's been with us before. And I invited her back because she had a book that came out that rocked my world. And it's about avoiding conflict and how to have deep, meaningful relationships in a way that you don't feel uncomfortable and that you can actually have an impact in all the relationships that you have at work and at home. And I love that it's through the lens of leadership, of course, right? It's really talking about all the work case studies. But Sarah, I'm just going to flash it up real quick so people can see, don't feed the elephants. Overcoming the art of avoidance to build powerful partnerships. Now, listen, anybody who knows, there's my post-its. We have things to talk about today, <laughs> right? But I, can I, we just start with why the book, why now? Um, and what inspired you to take this? Because it's such a practical tool for everybody. I would just love to know how we got here. Yeah, I, I have spent most of my life uh, avoiding difficult conversations. And to be clear, and I say this lovingly, I come from generations of avoiders. It is in my DNA being a Midwest white woman to be nice, to be, to smooth things over. And in an earnest, um, it was a really specific time when my interest in this changed, right? And so this, this has been the culmination of 13 plus years of interest, curiosity, research, practice, and, and the book is my, my love letter to my fellow conflict avoiders. Um, two, two really like monumental things happened around the same time that made me interested in this idea of the elephant in the room. The first was I was introduced to it. This isn't a concept we talk about in theater. Like that wasn't, <laughs> I mean, we're talking about an elephant in the room. It's like, what's the costume and who's playing all of that. But, um, but understanding that the, the best teams and the best relationships are ones where the elephant is freed called out or at the very least is, and, and hopefully um, is, uh, oh, you'll have to forgive my COVID brain, Lisa. It's a very real thing. And mm -hmm. so I, I say this openly and honestly to people, I'm, I'm week five and still navigating some, some brain glitches. Um, th but, but if we can prevent elephants or at the very least, they don't stick around very long. And what I realized is that I had never experienced a relationship where this was the norm. And I had never experienced a team where this was the norm. And so then I became really curious because I realized, well, part of the reason is because I don't know how to have these conversations. And, um, and I became curious of, of how, do we, how do we really actually create a culture uh, where this happens, where we can talk, you know, at the time, I wasn't familiar with the idea of psychological safety, which is obviously used much more frequently now, but um, like, how do we actually create that? And, and so why now? I... This was um, work that <laughs> lovingly say gestated for a long time. There's a lot of experimentation and a lot of exploring too, because obviously there's a lot, there, there are a number of really great books already written on how to have difficult conversations, how to have crucial conversations, all of that. And what I was hearing was so many of my clients or even before that, so many of my team members like, well, I took that class, but I'm not doing anything different. And so I became curious about, okay, well, if, if, if how to have the conversations our foot on the gas, what's our foot on the brake? And that's understanding our avoidance. Because if I, don't, if I don't understand why I'm avoiding, if I can't name that I'm avoiding, if I can't see that differently, then I can't show up differently. And so that's a little mm -hmm. bit of the background. Okay, so <clears throat> this is just me and we're gonna go here right away. So yeah. thank you for that. And I wanna talk about an elephant, mm -hmm. I think, which is COVID brain. Yeah. So we'll get into the book, but you just so beautifully showed people how to talk about something that is underneath and can mm. be impacting performance, confidence, trust, all that good stuff. So I just want to, I guess, just presence my appreciation that you brought that up in the way that you did. 
um, because you didn't come out like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm a broken mess. You were just like, hey, this is what's going on. I need to recalibrate a minute. Give me a sec. I'm going to process. Yeah. Right. And I think that's true beyond COVID brain with introverts need the same grace. Neurodivergent mm -hmm. leaders and mm -hmm. teams need the same grace. So Sarah, this is one of the things I always love about you is you just show up and you model things right away. So thank you. Oh, no, I appreciate that. I mean, and you, you and I talked about this earlier. I mean, it's easy to do that when you have a trusting relationship like you and I do. Mm. And, um, you know, when we talk about avoidance, I mean, sometimes it's easy to think of it just in terms of a conflict with another person, but there's a lot of conversations we avoid. And sometimes it's the conversations with ourselves and it's not always a conflict, right? Sometimes it's a, are just like that. I mean, being willing to talk about hard stuff, being willing to advocate for yourself, being willing to, you know, I mean, I'm experiencing that now. I'm very acutely aware of the rise in cases. And I'm also acutely aware that I'm often the only one who's wearing a mask and being okay that that's, that's how I'm going to show up. Mm, there's so much here. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I'm going to let that percolate for a second. Cause okay. I know I have a really compelling question, but I want to, I want to do your formal intro, right? So people yes. really know why all this. So 13 years um, researching and gestating this book, but you and your colleagues are on a mission to help the workplace, the workplace work better for humans, which yeah. is why I stalked you on Facebook early in the days. Um, and one way is helping have more curious, compassionate, and candid conversations. So can you just tell us a little bit about your business and what you do so we can help people really see that this isn't just your side hustle, trying to figure out how to get a book into the world. This is like your <laughs> right. life's work. Yeah, no, it really yeah. is, which is, <laughs> was, is amazing and terrifying all at the same time, right? Because it was like pre-launch was, but if I'm wrong, and I was like, no, I've got like almost 15 years experience. Oh my gosh, you got this. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah there's still stuff I don't know. And, you know, hence then you get to do second editions. Yeah. So my, my colleagues and I, um, we work with leaders and teams to help them explore how to have, again, different conversations with themselves and with other people. We both can agree. And I think anyone who would be tuning into your show can agree that the workplace hasn't worked for humans for a very, very long time. And, um, you know, and, and a big reason for that is so many of our systems and processes and cultures are set up to treat people like machines mm -hmm. and, um, and humans are complex and we have uh, fears and values and needs. And, um, and so, you know, the, the core of our work really is built on this belief that organizations are simply clusters of relationships. And one of the practices that really influences our work is the uh, work of conversational intelligence, which is our success is dependent on our relationships and our relationships is dependent on our conversations. So how do we have much more intentional and thoughtful conversations again with ourselves or with others? And so, yeah, so we support teams in a variety of way, but at its core, what we're trying to do is to increase the, um, understanding and honoring of the human complexity and, and building those powerful relationships. I, I'm so, I love how you talk about this so much because we always talk about putting the heart back into tech and then mm. back into the human, mm. right? Mm. And this is why when I, mm. I mean, I literally, this is a great story. I was on Facebook, um, LinkedIn scrolling. I saw one of your videos and your languaging on things. I was just like, I want to know more. And then for anyone who doesn't know this story, I watched a couple and then I wrote you a note. I just reached out and was like, I love what you're doing and keep going. And this is amazing. And here we are, you know, now building relationships based on aligned values, Yeah, and, you know, um, feeling called to bring this work into the world. So can, and we, can we just, can we just pause for a second? Yeah. Like just for listeners to, to know, Lisa and I have literally only had three conversations. Yeah, that's it. Over the last year and a half, two years, three conversations. And, and I just want to highlight that from the standpoint of, um, you know, because whenever I'm with you, it's like old friends and, um, and it feels so familiar and so familiar, like, like family. And, and that's largely because of, of I, I hope, how we both show up really intentionally about that. But I think that's when we talk about relationships when we're intentional, you can get there so much faster. 
Totally. Yeah. And yeah. so like, I just, I'm reflecting on this going like, oh yeah, we've known each other forever. And then I was like, oh no shit. We've only really only had three conversations. We had our prep conversation, our first interview, and then we've had this interview. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, that's so interesting too, because so many leaders right now are saying things like, we must all be back in the office. We have to be together. Right. Mm-hmm. And I always, for, for people that I connect with that I've never met, like you in, in like in IRL in real life, right. face to face, I'm like, oh, it's totally possible. But yeah, yeah you got to put your heart in right? Yeah. You got to bring your heart and you got to like be oh, vulnerable. Yeah. And, 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 and you have to be, and again, you have to be intentional because when, be we, intentional. when we hear people, especially when we think about working virtually or like remote or hybrid, you know, people will say, oh, it's just so much harder to build relationships. And I, and I hear that because it is different, but it's not totally different. It's not impossible. And I would argue most of us weren't great at building relationships before anyway. You just had way more uh, opportunities for chance encounters. And truthfully, what the virtual remote world is forcing us is to, to not just have these transactional interactions, but to be really intentional about transformational interactions. Yeah, I 100% agree with you so much. And I think that when I, when I just even reflect back on the last two years, I, I mean, I was on Clubhouse for a long time in the beginning of COVID. I've made amazing yeah. relationships without even seeing people. Right. And it, 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 just the lens that I'm looking at now between Clubhouse, LinkedIn, et cetera, is um, what is life like for people who are not able-bodied or perhaps even vision have vision as something that they can count on or hearing? And it's yeah. just really, I, in my mind, opened up my eyes and my heart a lot about how much you said was just taken, I'm going to put in air quotes for myself as an able-bodied human in the workforce two years ago. Like, oh, that was easy. I just meet them for lunch. Yeah. The intentionality is, yeah. And the inclusivity and it's really important. And that just reminded me, I'm going to turn on the transcript because oh yeah, I want that too. There we go. Oh, good catch. Right. So this is reminders too, because I forgot. And then I go, oh wait, now it's there. So yeah, no, it's being intentional about that. It, uh, you know, like a lot of people, we all had to move to virtual for our trainings and for our workshops. And the thing that um, I didn't realize before, because I just didn't understand how to do virtual differently, was how I actually think it's a preferred method. I think it's much more inclusive for exactly the reasons you've talked about. One, not every, you know, I'm, a, I, I'm an extrovert depending on the day, depending on the group, right? I, I, fluctu- <laughs> yeah. I feel like I've become more ambivert because of the pandemic. So I feel like I'm leaning more. So with you, you see more of that, but in the new group, I might be, but uh, who's clearly not afraid of a microphone. So in-person large events, I- I'm fine, but say somebody like my husband, who's much more introverted, who doesn't want to necessarily have the spotlight, but who wants to contribute, who wants to participate and that's the thing, again, if we, if we can look at these tools as ways to access more people and offer different ways for them to engage, you know, it's my, my dad actually said, he, uh, he and my mom uh, observed one of our a virtual session. And he goes, you know, Sam, that's what they call me. So whenever I tell a parent story, it's Sam, you know, Sam, you know, what's kind of neat is everyone is getting the same experience with you. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he goes, well, I've been in other presentations you've done and I stand in the back of the room and my eyesight's not great and the hearing's not great, which means I'm not getting as like full of an experience, but everyone who's on this call can adjust the hearing, like can adjust the volume, can turn on closed captioning and they all can see you exactly the same. And then what I would add is and people can contribute in the way that feels right to them. Yeah. Um, mm. And I think we, I think a lot of people still are missing that when we're uh, thoughtful, when we're aware of how we can make this a much more inclusive, and and also, like one, you know, let's talk about the fact that work isn't physically set up for everyone, but it's also often not safe for everyone. And so there's a lot of people who experienced a lot of aggressions, and I won't call them microaggressions, but aggressions that are able to be more productive and to add value in a way that they want to. You know, I really appreciate you bringing that. And I think it's going to go into some of our elephant talk too, because there's th- some of this is being avoided and, you know, mm-hmm. people aren't talking about it, but personal story, very quick. We're at rest. We're at a restaurant the other day and we don't go very often because we're COVID cautious, I guess is the word these days. 
Um, so we went out, we found a space, we were all alone. Our waiter, um, super nice, really kind. And then we went to pay the bill and he never came back. Mm. And I'm like, so weird. So we found someone say, hey. And they said, oh, he had to leave. He had to catch the bus. Mm. Mm. And I thought to myself, I don't mm. even think about having to catch a bus to get, right? And so I thought again, and my first thought was, well, if we were on Zoom, he wouldn't have to leave. Yeah, yeah. But he yeah. had to leave to get, to catch the bus for whatever was going on for him. And it just reminded me mm. that I don't know what's going on for everybody. And so he probably didn't want to come back to our table and say, excuse me, I have to go catch the bus. Right. So he Can I have my tip? left. Yeah. And I thought to myself, as I was reading, don't feed the elephants. I'm like, is there, what an opportunity to even talk about that, right? Like how might yeah. you have an amazing customer experience, feel confident in your decision. You might just simply say my shift is done. So-and-so is taking over, right? Yeah. But for whatever reason, that conversation didn't get had. And I just thought, oh. I want to unpack that with Sarah, mm -hmm. you know, That's, you so, know what I love. I love that. I mean, because again, we have all these missed opportunities to either, you know, more clearly communicate our needs to be able to connect more deeply. And mm -hmm. imagine if he came over and said, listen, it's been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed um, supporting, you know, or s serving you tonight um, in full transparency. I, I have to leave. And so if we could wrap up the bill, right. And if there's anything else, let me know, or so, so can, can take care of you because, you know, as somebody who worked on commissions from a retail perspective, mm -hmm. uh, not everyone is trustworthy to pass along. Said exactly. Commission. That's what I thought too, because uh, I really wanted to give him a great tip. He was so kind and he made it such a special experience for us. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to thank him and it was just gone. Yeah. Right. Just the yeah. opportunity to thank was gone. So yeah. Okay. So let's talk yeah. about elephants. Yeah, let's do it. Let's talk about elephants. Okay. So first of all, one thing I love so much, I'm going to bring it back up again. So the design of this beautiful gift to the world. Okay. <laughs> Pictures, lots of white space, mm. things to think about, it calls to action, examples. Um, I got to believe knowing as intentional as you are, there's some intentional design here. And I'd love to invite a conversation about that because talk about inclusive. Yeah. So share, share with me what, what inspired that? I, when I first sat down, pen to paper, key, fingers to keyboard, thinking about this, I found myself uh, feeling really paralyzed, not just from the writing of it, but uh, as somebody who grew up in the academic world, as somebody who often reads books that are more academically, I... I was struggling with what's the tone, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm taking you back, Lisa. Yeah. I'm taking you back to the journey of where we came from. That's good. And, and I remember struggling, like, what is it a serious, like, what, what, what makes a, like, a credible book? What makes a serious book? What kind of book should this be? Which, you know, let's just call it whenever we ask ourselves the, what should we do? Mm -hmm. We're asking the wrong <laughs> question. But I, I was lamenting to my friend Shadley, who's such a great creative uh, friend. And he goes, honestly, Sarah, write the book you would want to read. Mm -hmm. And he said, what book would you want to read? And it was in that moment that I realized I don't finish most books, not because they're not great. Some books I do, but a lot of them I struggle with. Um, I kind of like get what I need and then I move on. And, you know, and so uh, being diagnosed with ADHD later in life, I realized that it is really difficult for my, my personal neurodivergent brain, and I now, I now know I'm not alone and unique in this, to hold focus when it's really heavy text, uh, like, you know, and no visual breaks. And so not only did I want to be intentional about this feeling very conversational, I want it to be accessible, I want it to be a quick read for people, um, but I also intentionally uh, working with my publisher, we designed it for a neurodivergent brain. Because when we can design something, for sort of the, you know, for the people who get left behind, it serves everyone. And so, so that's why there's so many illustrations to visually reinforce it. You know, here's the fun thing that I learned about illustrations too, is it's also in a book, it gives you a, a cue of where to go back to. So it isn't just in the moment that it's reinforcing, but you're like, oh yeah, it was that, it was that chart and I can flip back to mm -hmm. it. So it makes recall easier. Uh, like you said, a lot of white space called out boxes, um, wanted it to be practical because that's our whole philosophy theories. Great tools are better. Uh, a lot of times you read, you know, books and you're like, well, this is great, but how the hell do you do it? Yep. So yep. I wanted to be really intentional about that. But this was very much 
designed with a neurodivergent brain in mind, knowing that it would also benefit and be a good, hopefully easy read for a neurotypical brain. Dude. Okay. This is when I dropped the dude, like, dude. <laughs> so full transparency, right? I read this book in an afternoon hmm. at a water park. I love home. that. That's what I want. I did. Went to the water park. She's like, I'm going down the slides. I'm all cool. I'm going to talk to Sarah. I want to be prepared. This was last week. And because I've had it for a while, but I was like, I always want to have it fresh when I talk to yeah. the author. It just matters. Yeah, I hear you. So yeah. And then I, you should have heard me at the water park. Oh, oh, ah. And then she'd check in. I go, hey, look at this. I mean, it's crazy. This is how I am when I read stuff that just resonates. So I think one of the things that I thought was so, um, I'm flipping because I want to find the right words. One of the things that just rocked my world was you took us on a journey about like ourselves, Mm -hmm. right? In relation to others and then kind of like back to yourself into action. So, Mm -hmm. and I love, and so many times you say things like, if you're feeling uncomfortable, like there's more work to do here. Yeah. You probably want to skip this chapter. It's okay. I got you. Like you're always, as you would facilitate, to make someone feel safe, your written word, Mm. it's like, you know, right then, like, oh yeah, this might be bumpy, but she's telling me it's okay. So I'm going to go for it. I loved it so much. Mm. Um, And listen, there's all kinds of elephants in here and I'm not going to, and we've we've discovered new ones. Oh, I bet people are helping you name them, right? People are creating them. They're sending them to us. Yeah. And I'd listen, I have so much to say. I I have a couple of elephants I'd like to share into your version too. Second edition. But here's the thing when we just at the highest level you wrote, here's what happens when we allow an elephant to linger. Distrust increases and trust decreases. Team members grow disengaged and disheartened. Creativity and innovation can't thrive. People spend energy avoiding instead of taking action. And ongoing stress can harm a person's mental and physical health. So if we didn't say one more thing about that, that's why you want to read this book, Mm -hmm. right? Holy cannoli. You got it all right there. That's it. That's all you need to know. No, it, it, well, I mean, it, I, again, I, I think, I don't think here's what I've learned. I'm trying to catch my language. Mm, What I've learned in working with thousands of people now is we become so good and, and, uh, equipped at tolerating avoidance that it just becomes the default Mm -hmm. and sometimes we may have to start there from a like an initial protection mechanism but we have to know when when do we need to interrupt it you know and and just to speak on that a second because some people go some some people will 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 will, uh go too far they'll swing too far like we got to have a conversation about everything we got to do it now and they over rotate and it's like whoa 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 <laughs> like that might be an um, alligator bah, 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 bah. like yeah 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 uh there's some you know depending on the situation some mm-hmm. some steps that might be valuable but i i want to say this there are times when we aggressively avoid right passive aggressively i want you to know that i'm ignoring you right now i'm very it's like a very aggressive avoidance uh, there's that fearful avoidance of I'm afraid of what they're going to do. What's going to happen to me? Are they going to still like me? Is there going to be retaliation? But then there's a third one. And, and this is something that's become clearer in post the book and having more conversations and doing work with people is, and there are times when we can consciously and should consciously avoid mm. like, or disengage that there might be times when we're not safe. And there might be times where we go, I don't have the energy today, but, but, but we but we can't choose that intentional choice of, do I act or not? Do I have the conversation or not? If we're not aware of it. Um, Yep. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. They cost so much. No, it's no, I love it. But I mean, the thing, the, the thing is, is the, the price again, it can be so significant to, to you or to the erosion of your relationships. I mean, this is something that I am, you know, when you write a book on having difficult conversations, you're sort of expected now to always be having the conversation. Oh, you know what? Yeah. Don't we learn what we teach and have to keep learning, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And sometimes I want to be like, Hey family, I don't, I don't need to be the, I don't need to be the mediator and I'm not. 
but 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 it's made me realize even more so in my personal relationships how many relationships eroded because I was unwilling to have the conversation or they were and the other party didn't even know mm -hmm. I can say okay I just made an elephant noise how's that did you hear that I made an elephant noise. I want a peanut I, I do have right a okay so <laughs> One of the things you talked about, and I think I want to highlight this for everybody. So in the, in the land of leaders in tech, mm. always on, never good enough, we'll replace you tomorrow. Mm. We manage our budgets through layoffs. It's happening all around us right now. Yeah. People get all constrained and freaked out. Don't talk about it. Just hold on, shut down, try and knock it on the list, right? And then sometimes thrilled they're on the list and hoping there's something next. You know, all of that yeah. goes through it. <clears throat> and you talk a lot in the beginning about the book about trust. Mm. And how you, you don't get to decide if you're trustworthy. People decide it based on how you show up. Yeah. Right? Well, how you well, have conversations. And, and, and like, and, and just to add to it, like mm -hmm. just, I want to, I want to expand on this. Cause this is something that um, my friend Neha Sampat pushed me on. She's like, and they're going to make that decision based off their bias towards you. So totally. Yep. That's so good. It's, it's true mm -hmm. that we can't control if we're trustworthy, we can influence it. We can try to impact it. Um, and we also have to understand that sometimes just because of who we are, what we look like, who we love, what we believe mm -hmm. can contribute to that. So, sorry, I just wanted no, to, it's important. I wanted no. to honor, honor that. Push. This is what I say. There is no, sorry. We honor this because this is, this is like real life. And these are the conversations yeah. we have. Right. Mm -hmm. So when let that, bop, 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 bop. you had a whole piece in here about fear of change. Mm -hmm. And I think it ties to trust because totally. I think you're not going to be as afraid if you trust that your boss has your back or that you'll be in the loop or that you're valued or what not all. Um, I just said, what not all. I crack myself mm -hmm. up sometimes. I totally, I follow. But can we, can we expand on the afraid of you right in here? We're afraid of loss. Yeah. And this always on never good enough. We'll replace you tomorrow. That's a lot of loss fear going on. Yeah. yeah. So I'd love to talk about that with you. I'd love to invite your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure you heard it. You maybe you've believed it. I know I've believed it at one point. I'm sure I said it out loud. Well, people fear change. And it's like, well, people fundamentally change all the time. We're always evolving. Um, and so sometimes, you know, we'll say that like, oh, people just fear change when they're resistant to something. But it's not that people fear change, they fear loss. And, and that could be loss of control. That could be loss of autonomy. That could be loss of, as we talk about virtual workplace, like autonomy, privacy, flexibility. It could be loss of stability. Uh, it can be loss of familiarity. I mean, I think this is something too, and I imagine uh, you know this is certainly true with a lot of the clients you work with. Is technology is constantly changing, and so you might be an expert in something that's no longer yep. uh, relevant. And so now the loss is: Will I still be of value and as much value as we move to this new system and as we implement this new thing? And so, so one of the things that I often see leaders falling into the trap of is when change is happening, even if it's positive change, even if it's like a good change, people can get irritated that somebody might be cautious or skeptical, or maybe like in a wait and see uh, without getting curious with, well, what's the loss they're experiencing or, or that they think they're experiencing? Quick story. So this is one of my favorite stories. I was uh, doing a Q&A after a session and this uh, executive asked the question, how, how can you deliver maybe difficult news that might impact team members in a way that they will not have a reaction, like a, a, a stressful or emotional reaction? And I knew, I could tell that she was thinking about a specific situation. And I said, well, like, what's, what's the scenario? Like, give me a scenario. What are we talking about? And this was shortly after the, like, the start of the pandemic. And she said, um, you know, for example, if you're having to make salary cuts. And you know, my, my first question was more of a reflection back. So I want to make sure I'm clear that you are fundamentally impacting someone's livelihood. You could be fundamentally impacting their stress levels. You could be fundamentally impacting, right, their access to resources. And you want them to not have a reaction. Is that because you want a lack of reaction for them or for you? And shut up. Okay, so is that, you got to say it again. Is that because do you, you, wanna, do you, you want them to be without emotion for them or do you want it to be for you? 
Damn. She knew the answer. She was like, as soon as I reflected it back. And, and I think that especially now, I mean, there's a lot of volatility. There's a lot, I mean, and it's such an, isn't it an interesting time? Because on one hand, it's, it's, it's the employer's employees market on some Mm -hmm. level. And on the other hand, there's a lot of like tumultuous turnover and, uh, reductions, right? It's my favorite Mm -hmm. word reductions. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and there's some amount of <laughs> the way I, like, uh, you might not be able to make a situation like that better. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things you can do to make sure it's not worse, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's it's a mm-hmm. it's a crap situation when you have to lay off people. I mean, that was that was a moment that that planted the seed of this book was 2008 financial crisis. Yep. Email yep. from senior executives saying, "Hey, we're going to have staff reductions." first I heard of it, my team is like processing it, went to my manager, said, hey, we're going to talk about it. And she was like, talk about what? And, and in that moment, right, that lack of acknowledgement, that lack of just even naming, yeah, this is hard. We don't have all the information. We're going to do what we can, right? Even just naming that, the trust just went out the window. And then the distrust came and, 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 a, a company that's going over layoffs is a stressed company anyway, mm-hmm. that we don't need to add to it um, by our unwillingness to talk about the shit that's right in front of us. Pardon my language, but like- No, dude, rock and roll. You know? The shit that's right in front of us. Yeah. And as leaders, one of the things that I know is they get caught up um, too, because always on never good enough where we place you tomorrow yeah. isn't just individual contributors it's leaders too oh, and so when sure. you have this i think just presencing we're not afraid of change especially in tech which changes every day right. we're afraid of loss so yeah. if you're thinking in your mind what's at stake right it's something they care about something that matters to them what are they afraid of losing you set yourself up already in a better space to even think about how to yeah. show, show up with compassion or empathy doesn't mean you can fix it but at least you're right. kind of in right. that right spot, right? So yeah. then in your book, when you go to, and there's a lot of different ways you do this, right? So I'm, well, I'm not going to teach the book, but I want to highlight enough so people know they want to go get this, right? You talk about getting curious and you have a self-curiosity question toolkit. And I love, 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 love the question on page 122. You said, one of the things to ask yourself is, is my reaction about preference Mm. process or performance mm. and i at the water bar was like yes 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 right. so can we please you got so excited your earbuds just my earbud just from your head because like what a gift you gave the reader mm. and anyone who chooses to go down this path a, a different lens to look at this to be able to then understand and ascertain for themselves so can you talk about preference process and performance yes i would love to because honestly if there was if there's one question, I mean, I have lots of them, but that is, that's probably <laughs> my top 10 of people just asking themselves when they have issues with someone or like challenges in a relationship or a manager who's struggling with a team member. Okay. But first I have to pause for a second because yeah. there's two points I want to make going back to the last one. Since yeah, yeah, I know yeah. that a lot of the people who listen are people leaders and they're in those positions of, of formal authority and power. Mm-hmm. First, when we talk about loss, it is really important you do not confuse what is important to you for what's important to them. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of times people will be like, oh, it's not that big of a deal, like suck it up buttercup. But it, just because it's not a big deal to you doesn't mean it's not a big deal to them, right? Those can be mutually exclusive, yep. right? The other thing is depending on the situation, you likely as the leader have access to information, have influence over the situation and have had time to process something that your team is just hearing about for the first time. So this is when we talk about giving some grace Mm -hmm. uh, is you've had 18 months to figure out this whole restructure, reorg, new technology, right? Like this new way of doing things. And they're just hearing about it for the first time. So like, let's, let's throw them a bone a bit for them to be able to, to process that. Okay. So, so now going back to pre- sorry, I just, I had to, no, I, I, I'm going to go there really quick. With you, real fast. We okay. I had another guest on, um, and she was, I, she basically, basically saying the number one problem she sees is the lack of strategic communications. 
which ties to what you're saying. She's like basically waging war on your employees because you're not telling them even the the popcorn trail to get there. And then you're like, ta-da. And they're like, what the F? Right, right. Right. right, So it's perfect. I love, love, love it. And yes, I'm in. And so, yes, let's go to the preference preference process or performance Mm -hmm. filters. Yes. So first, foundational. When there's a challenge in a relationship, it is often because there's a need that is not being met or a value that's not being honored or being stepped on. We don't always go to that level. We just focus on being irritated with the team member or frustrated Mm -hmm. with the other person. But it's always that, whether that's like, I have a need to be heard, I have a need to be supported, I wanna be mentored. I mean, I was just working with somebody recently who was like, "I, I just, I don't think my boss can mentor me and coach me in the way that I need and want. It's like, yeah, that makes sense that there's this disconnect in that relationship. So often I see particularly preference versus performance. I'll say that. I see a lot of people who confuse, particularly managers who confuse something that is a preference to them and they think it's a performance issue but it's not. So one of the ways we think about relationships is that we, we use this island metaphor. I have my island and on my island are my needs, my values, my personality, my lived experiences, my neurodiversity, my, right, I'm tired last night because I didn't get any sleep. That's on my island. Um, on your island, that's all of those things. And what happens is that we get really comfortable and we like, and we prefer our way of doing things. And it's not, I literally was just having this conversation today. It doesn't necessarily mean that you think your way is superior. You just prefer it because it feels good and it feels right to you. And so a lot of times uh, conflict is what Dr. John Gottman calls perpetual conflict. Like 70% of all relationship challenges are perpetual conflicts where there's a conflict of preferences. You know, I, somebody I was just talking about today, they like things very orderly. They like things very planned. They want to think through all of the possibilities and that has served them really well. And we were joking that I'm like the opposite end. I am this ID. You typically I'm an idea generator. I like to change sometimes for change sake, right? I'm super flexible and, and those can be in conflict with each other. And so if, if, if she was my manager, she could sure confuse my ability to get done the way I get things done my way, right? Mm-hmm. As a performance issue when it's really just a preference for her. So, and, and that doesn't mean that you can't have a conversation about that. It's just, instead of it being like, you're doing it wrong, it's now the conversation needs to be, how do we do this together? So we like to think of it as how do we build our island together, right? So what do you need? What do I need? Mm-hmm. And, and to that point, boy, do we not, spend enough time setting relationships up for success because we tend to focus on the task instead of the togetherness until there's an issue. And by then, sometimes the issue is too far gone that we can't repair it or come back from it or we don't know how to. Um, yeah, and then, and then obviously processes is the issue with a structure or process that's in place of you might want something done differently, but it can't be done that way because it's a process and does that need to be explored? But um, so good. Yeah. yeah I, I'm sure the entire water park was like, what's going on over there? Cause I was like, <laughs> if there is one gift and you've seen all the post-its, I was like, I only have so much time with Sarah. I'm asking that question because one of the things I know is that even, I mean, every engagement we do with our clients, whether it's coaching workshops, speaking, it doesn't matter. We're always starting with I first self-awareness. Mm-hmm. How am I wired? What are my preferences? Mm-hmm. What feels good? Right. I even asked yeah. you, how do you want to feel? Right. Yeah always then we can get to the we which is another person then we get to the us yeah man if you are not aware enough in your own lane to figure out is it preference process or performance you're already setting yourself up to fail or avoid you're already eating the peanuts right yeah 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 yeah. Yeah. like you're eating the peanuts and you're throwing them over to your elephant friend like you're both you know eating out of the bag together this is (laughs) this is this is why um this is this this was a gap in other work that I came across mm-hmm. was it was all about jumping to the conversation when we weren't even clear about what conversation needed to happen. Mm-hmm. And we weren't setting people up to get really clear about the conversation that needed to happen with themselves first. Because I mean, let's let's like talk to that point. Um, 
self-awareness isn't just experiencing something it's understanding well why did i experience what what is it about that and truthfully i think the hardest moments for us to get curious with ourselves is when we're having to have the courage to say what role did i play in it which isn't a question that people ask enough when especially in relationships you know i mean yes are there times when the other person is just at fault absolutely mm -hmm. But a lot of times there's probably some role that you've played that has contributed to it. And you just don't want to, because our egos are really strong. We want to be right and be on our Island and all of this, but it's a, I, I, I think true, the practice of self-awareness is a real act of courage and a willingness to go not, you know, we talk about psychological safety, for example, mm -hmm. I don't want leaders to make a list of all the ways they make it safe. I want them to make a list of all the ways they make it not safe. Exactly. I want them yeah. to make a list of what they do or not do that actually gets in the way of someone feeling safe. And I want them to have the courage to be able to explore that and answer that because that's actually where real change happens. Mm -hmm. Everything else is just like lip service or feels good or, but if we don't figure that out again, that foot on the gas, foot on the brake, then we're yeah. just going to yeah. spin in circles. I think it's so important. And I actually, um, <clears throat> I want to just, I'm going over to my overhead for a second because I really want to land this. Mm. So you have this beautiful drawing of curiosity and knowledge. So for yeah. anyone who's listening and not seeing, we're on page 116. And basically there's a bell curve. And on the left, it says, don't know, don't care. In the center, it says, I want to learn more. And on the right, it says, I already know it all. And it's the um, axis of curiosity and knowledge. And I think you just talked about that so much. And I had actually had this open to ask you mm. the thing you had on the next page that I think is worth exploring. I'm going to, you'll see all my writings. <laughs> I love that you have a checklist. It's not a curious question. If <laughs> no, you're not doing reflective work. If <clears throat> right. You know the answer. You already have a position and you're guiding to the position. You're pretending not to know. You don't want to know the answer or you're looking for validation or reassurance of your idea. Like, what in the what? I mean, <laughs> put that up on the wall. Okay. And that is- That needs to be a poster. We'll add that to the product line. Yes, like. it needs to be, or a, a screen, a wall on your phone, wallpaper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hundred percent. And you know, you know I mean, what? I've done that. I've, I am guilty of all of these. And every time <sighs> I did one of those, oh mama, if trust was already there, the other person's yeah. like, Yo, Dury, what the hell? Right. Or did you want my feedback? Or yeah. are you curious about how I feel? Yeah, I mean, just because think... just because you add a question mark on the end of the statement doesn't make it a question. And it sure is exactly. helpful to make a curious question. Yeah, and I'm famous for this one where I actually was in a group meeting and I was really tired and I wanted somebody to tell me I was doing a good job. Words of affirmation is my love language. Mm -hmm. So what do I do in front of like 13 people in a very busy meeting? I'm like, hey, aren't we doing a great job? Yeah, that's curious, isn't it? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> my colleague says, well, actually this and that, and this and this, and this, like the whole, and I'm just like shutting down and pissed off and like, right. And I said in the moment, thank God, hmm. you know what? I think I asked the wrong question. Uh... I think I need a moment to recalibrate because what you're saying is that important. And I can feel myself not listening mm -hmm. and I don't want to do that to you. So I need 10 and I left, I cried. <laughs> I realized, holy crap, I came back. And then we had the conversation. And what happened in that moment was people were like, <clears throat> should we say anything? I don't know. But the person who I had the trust with went back in and was like, you asked, I'm going to tell you. Yeah. Afterwards, we debriefed. And I said, how scared were you? She goes, I wasn't worried about it at all. I know we're good. Yeah. I said, but everyone in that room just learned. Right. And so I was so grateful to her because she answered my question. But I didn't ask the right question. That, yeah, yeah, that yeah, question yeah. was not a curious question. Mm -mm. No, I love, God, I mean, there's so <clears throat> much I love about the, the modeling, right? I mean, that's, that's where self-awareness comes into play of being able to catch it in the moment, to be able to regulate, to be able to say, hey, it's also what a great example of, um, you can't control the initial stress reaction, but we can try to recover from it. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish, I wish more people, I wish it was more normalized for people to say, I actually need a minute. This is, this is hard for me to process. Mm -hmm. I'll be okay in a moment, but just like, I just need a minute. Um, Cause again, we want people to be machines. Like you shouldn't have any reaction. Well, right? you know, that, that yeah. happens so fast, yeah. but I also love the realization of, oh, I didn't ask the right question. 
And, you know, and, and which may have looked different of, Hey, what do we want to celebrate? Exactly. Right. right? Or whatever. This question. Yeah. Yeah. What wins do we have? What celebrations do we have? What are we proud of? Like there's so yeah. many different ways. It's, well, and, and I think that, um, uh, you know, part of where that section came from is again, I'm guilty of all of them. I'm guilty of everything. Like nothing, yeah. there's nothing. Welcome to being uh, human, Sarah. Yep, exactly. Like, congratulations. Yep. I feel like I, I wrote that a lot. Like, congratulations, you're human, you know, like, yeah. da-da. Um, but I would see this gap between how people thought they were showing up and how they were actually showing up, right? It was a gap between their intentions and their actual impact or them not being really honest or clear with themselves about what their intentions were. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I'm all for people being devil's advocate, but sometimes people, the intention is power. The intention is ego. The intention is right. A whole host of things. And, um, oh, where was I going? I had a, I had a thought there. Shoot. And I missed it. I think I can help you bring it back if you okay. want to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah. So one of the things I'm hearing you talk about is that I wasn't clear on my intention. Yeah. I just went in wanting to feel good and needed my own love language met in the moment. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've been, I've learned my whole life. You need to know your intended outcome before any conversation. Mm -hmm. So in the power of pausing before I went in, I might've asked the question. So when you were talking about like self-regulation, recalibrating, being human and looking at the whole thing, um, I guess it is a good example that, you know, it is possible to be a leader and mm -hmm. be human mm -hmm. and take time for yourself to come back to actually be a better version of yourself than you were in that moment. So that's kind of a leader, I think, you know, oh. because I mean, well, because in that moment, <clears throat> I mean, there's so many things that you're role modeling, you're showing that it's okay to uh, disagree, even if it's with yourself, mm -hmm. you're showing that it's okay to quote unquote fail or be messy, right? Mm -hmm. You're also showing that it's okay to do a do over. You're showing what it looks like to, again, emotionally regulate um, so that we can have this conversation. Uh, I assume had the person not shared it, you probably would have pushed to say, okay, no, I'm like, let's go back there. Like we need to understand. I would have, oh, well, 100%. Right? Yep. And, yep. I mean, instead, like, cause yep. what happens is people have the reaction, then they get defensive and then they shut down or they fight or they, whatever the case is. And it's all over their faces. And it's like that, that pause is so important. And and I hear you, I hear you when you say, you know, if I would have prepared in life, we aren't always going to be able to prepare, yep, but if totally. we can, right, try to catch it in the moment and recover. I mean, that's the thing that I, I, I'm so passionate about is helping people understand not as an excuse, but that that stress response, it happens so fast sometimes. And we know that with all the trauma, all the long-term exposure to stress that we've been experiencing collectively over the last few years, as people have experienced it individually, that trigger is getting faster. Yeah. It's and right so, under the surface, right? It, it is. Yeah. And yep. you know, it's like, I don't even know, I don't have my normal baseline anymore. And so, <laughs> yep. so we, you know, we have to build the muscle to recover in those moments to say, let me try that again. Um, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it. I think it, it would be interesting for people to read through that and go, which ones are they guilty of from the standpoint of, you know, why, 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 do, why did you think that was a good idea? Not a curious question. Not, <laughs> not, mm -mm. Let's try that one again. It's interesting because we always have a double dog dare on this episode. So I feel like that's the double dog dare. Get the book <laughs> and go see what you do, right? Yeah. Not, don't make the list of all the things you're awesome at. Make a list of the things that you, you could be inflicting on others yeah. simply because of your own bias, the experience or whatever. Cause one of the things you talk about is how to apologize, mm. which by the way, for all the conflict avoiders, right. If you actually did something like my example, you have to come back in. Yeah. Right? So center your, um, you can either center your apology around your lack of knowledge or respond in earnest. I love the words you <laughs> use because <laughs> you said something so know. critical you talk about in here just because you didn't intend something yeah. negative doesn't really let you off the hook. Mm -mm. So even yes. me in that moment, I didn't intend anything negative, but I was still on the hook. Like I, I still created that experience and had the relationship and positional power that I, I need to do something. Yeah. So I could have gone, Oh, well, I'm sorry. That didn't feel good. And let's just celebrate. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's why it's why I, I actually take issue 
with the practice of assuming good intent. I, mm. I think on practice, I, I think in, in theory, it's not a bad way to be, but let's be very real. Who is allowed to have assumptions made about their intentions? It is almost never the person who received oppression. It is almost never the person who received harm. It is almost always the person who's in power who did it. And, and it's not just, so for me, I don't assume bad intent. I just stay curious about intent. Like mm, I'm just going to stay so really much. curious about intention. And, 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 you know, if I step on someone's toes and it's not, and, and, and I, I want to make a point, you can tell I'm jazzed up. I had to stand for this. I love it. Um, it's not that intentions don't matter because if you say something to me, that's harmful. And even if, I don't know, if you, if you need to say that wasn't my intention, however, that was the impact. And I own that that is different than you doing something harmful intentionally. So I just, I want to, I do want to mm -hmm. differentiate yep. that like, yep. if what you did, but, but the problem with that is most of us are unwilling or unable to actually get curious enough to know when we were poking the bear, to get curious enough and to own when we had that shadow intention of like, I'm hugging you, but I'm poking you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so like, that's, I think the last question I want to ask you, cause it's this, I, I highlighted it in here. I wanted you to talk about shadow intention. So yeah. when I, I'll, let me summarize real quick. So as a leader listening today, boy, we've said a lot, right? We talked about like the foundation of trust and what it means to be curious. We've talked about neurodiversity and designing for all needs, inclusivity. Mm -hmm. We've looked at virtual work, remote work, hybrid, in-person, all of the different lenses of the stress response and how to pause and, and intention and what it means and what it doesn't mean. Um, and how to be curious in a way that's helpful to yourself and others. Mm -hmm. And then there's the shadow intention. Mm -hmm. And I, I really think it's important that we presence that so that when people go and read this book that you can read very easily whenever you want, that that part really stands out. Cause I think that isn't talked about enough. Mm -mm. No, because we live in the land of good intentions. Mm -hmm. You know, there was, there was a period where I was trying to parse out what are the different common intentions, like just trying to understand it to make meaning because there were times in my position as a leader, HR coach, where I just had a front row view to human behavior, which then also makes me then reflect on myself. And I think in any situation we have a super intention you know, what do we need to get done? What am I, why am I asking? You know, you have a super intention about inviting me. I think in a lot of situations we have a self intention, like a self, not selfish necessarily. Like super intention is let's bring Sarah on to talk about the book. Self intention is, and it's going to be fun. Like for mm -hmm. us to like, I think we both selfishly we're like, yeah, let's make this happen. Cause we both benefit when we're in conversation because our brains are so wired for protection. And that's protection from physical pain, mental pain, emotional pain. In fact, the brain will work way harder at protecting us from pain than it will pushing us towards something positive. That's just how it's, right? How we're mm -hmm. created. Um, there are times, whether we're conscious of it or not, whether we're willing to consider where we have shadow intentions. And those shadow intentions come from a place of self-protection. They come from a place, typically for me, I will say this, typically for me, and I see this in clients, shadow intentions often show up when we feel powerless in a situation in the way we want to feel more power is by having power over someone. So that is criticizing them, that is dismissing them, that is ignoring them, that is discrediting them, right? Because there is something about them that was a threat or the situation where we feel powerless and the way we're going to regain our powers instead of from within, it's going to be over someone. And I'll share an example. I mean, this is a, uh, you know, I'm not like proud of it. <laughs> I'm never hey, proud of my shadow my, intentions. I just told you my fabulous meeting. Like, I wanted to feel good. <laughs> you know, so a couple of years ago, when I first got my start, there was another consultant here in town uh, doing similar work, albeit different. And she came out with this really great uh, video trailer. Only I didn't think it was great. I sat there and it was like, Ugh, that's like stock footage. And I got into this super critical mindset, really judgy. Not that I, and it's not even that I said it out loud. I didn't share it with anyone. 
But then, you know, in the spirit of getting curious with myself of going, wow, Sarah, you're being really critical. I was like, what, like, where is that coming from? And when I got down to it was I was envious. I was jealous of what she had produced. And I was worried that that would maybe set her apart differently for me. So in that moment, mm -hmm. I felt like I had lost power or I had lost like influence or I was threatened by it. And the way that I was trying to make myself feel better is by tearing down what she had done, which in earnest, one, didn't really affect me or matter to me. But mm -hmm. two, it was a lovely video. Um, but how many times it was kind of like, I, <laughs> I once had somebody come up, I mean, it ended up not being a shadow intention, but it could, I had somebody come up after a, a talk I did. It's kind of like a Ted talk style. And he goes, wow, that was surprisingly good. <laughs> and I was just, I didn't know how to respond, <laughs> but I said, I said, I don't, I don't know how to take that. Like, how did Okay, wait, hold on. I'm going to come back to, I want to come back to a, a technique actually my therapist shared with me that's really good in moments like these. But I said, I don't know how to take that. And he goes, it's just that every other speaker wasn't that interesting. So I just assumed everyone was, mm -hmm. which is like a nice compliment, but you don't need to compliment me by like tearing down other people. But mm -hmm. right, so it explained it. But if you're in a moment where you feel like someone's shadow intention is speaking, right? Like they're, they're poking, they're hurting, they're whatever. A really powerful question we can ask is, how, how did you want me to feel when you said that? That is freaking awesome. Right? Don't we love our therapist? Oh my gosh. She's God. every, every penny. I feel like I how did borrow you from her me all the time. Feel when you said that. Yeah. I just like, and again, genuine curiosity. How did you, mm -hmm. how did you want me to feel when you said that mm -hmm. is a way of holding up the mirror. Mm -hmm. to say, ouch, and to push it back on them. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what can happen is if people get called out, they can like go yeah, into yeah, super yeah. defensive mode. But okay, so here, here is a real quickly, uh, a technique that, you know, you can use, and it's not unique, but I want to, I want to connect it to this. Um, right, the whole practice of the story I tell myself is, I love this if, so much, right? Yep. If yep. you think someone is coming from that place of shadow intention, don't accuse them, but to offer it up as a genuine, like, I just want to try this out. I got to be honest. The story I tell about, like the story I'm telling myself about you is blank. And what I have found most of the time is when my intuition is accurate, people might not own up to it verbally, but non-verbally, they almost can't even control themselves. Yeah. <clears throat> I agree. Yeah. You right? can see the body go. Oh, shit. Oh. <laughs> and, and like, and sometimes it's like a, a knowing smirk, like, like I, yeah, I had a yeah. Yeah. <laughs> real, I, real, quick, yeah. real quick story. <laughs> I was working with a leader, um, you know, feedback about her wasn't great uh, from everyone, but she was very willing and she was ready and she was committed and she worked her tail off and she did the hard internal work. She was showing up differently in her relationships. And, and like nine, nine, 10 months pass. And the feedback we are getting consistently from everyone is, wow, she's made so much improvement. We can see that this really matters to her. We really appreciate it. There was one team member though, who just kept giving the same feedback. And at some point he stood out, right? And he's like, I don't know, Sarah. I just don't think she's gonna, I, you know. And, and I finally just said, hey, Scott, I just got to test this assumption. The story I'm telling myself is there's nothing she can do that would change your mind. How true is that? And he just smirked and then proceeded <laughs> to go, I think I would be a better manager. Yep. Ah, there's your there shadow intention, my friends. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Such a good story. Yeah. So for anyone listening, for everyone listening, we're just going to say for, if you're listening to my voice right now, the invitation the, the true, true invitation is to get the book. Mm -hmm. It's to do the work. It's to go figure out what elephant you've got. I, I mean, I have three or four easily on a daily basis that I'm oh, working yeah. through, right? It's not like, oh, I'm going to score a perfect score. No, it's all going to yeah. show up. But the thing about the books are that I love so much for everybody to know is you don't just leave them with the awareness. You give them mm -hmm. words to use, actions to take, things to think about. I mean, you're not leaving anybody hanging here. You're literally scooping them up, sitting them on your couch in the background and going, here's some ideas, right? And mm -hmm. you can do with it what you want, but I can tell you, I mean, even 
in my own weekend, navigating my weekend. I just started seeing things differently after reading this. So what a gift you've given the world. Um, I have two final questions for you as we wrap this up. The first one is, I believe music can feed the spirit, soothe the soul and help us regulate our nervous system. And we have a playlist and I'd love to put a song in the playlist that if someone were to get curious or Mm -hmm. reflect, or perhaps have an epiphany moment with this and sit with it, with your book, what song would you like us to tie to that? I don't know that this is the appropriate song. Oh, fair (laughs) enough. I need to think about- What comes to mind? I need to think about the lyrics, but um, the thing that the thing that's coming up is "Welcome to the Jungle," and, and the reason the jungle, that one, yeah. Okay. So yep. the lyrics might not fit, right? Yeah. But kind of the intensity a little bit. Not that I want people to come into it intense. Yeah. But I think that the thing that's coming up for me is that one of the most common, common, common things we hear from people that keeps them from having the conversation is that they want it to be comfortable and without discomfort. And I do not believe that if something matters, I do not believe if we are taking a risk and I do not believe that the relationship is important, it will be without discomfort. And so the goal is not for us to remove discomfort, it is, but it's for us to not be paralyzed by it so we can be present with it so that we can move into it. So I don't know that, I don't know the lyrics. I kind of feel like, head, I, but there's some like kind of just like- You got it. Eh, no, I think you're right on. It's gonna be messy. It's gonna yeah. be imperfect. It's gonna be, you know, again, I need to, I need to think a little, I'm, I'm going to think of it more and I'll probably come up with something. Yeah, like, well, I have that it in the background of my head going, you're gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe this isn't the right. <laughs> no, no, but it, here's the thing. Compare that to It's a Small World. Yeah. Mine, right. No, yeah. you're trying to convey like it's messy and it's scary and you don't know what's around the next corner. If there's a snake in the grass or I'm pointing up and I'm talking about the grass, right. Or there's a monkey in the tree or whatever. Like, I think the, the underneath what you're talking about fits really well with what, what I went through, even reading it. Cause you're like, Oh, yeah. oh ah. you know, it's not some paved okay. road that's super simple. Here's, here's another song that just came up. Yeah. Nor- Nora Jones. I don't know why. I don't know why. Okay. And it's just about like, I don't know why I didn't call. I don't know why this happened. I don't know why this, I mean, like, and maybe that's a place of just like, so get curious about why, like, why didn't you call? Why didn't you have, it's also one of my favorite songs. Oh, I love Nora Jones too. Okay, cool. Okay. So then last question, drum roll, please. (sighs) When you think about someone who hasn't read your book and they're getting it for the first time, what is your advice to the reader as they navigate it? I think it's important to help them know what to make the most of the experience. I'll I'll actually share what my mom shared. Mm. So after my parents read an early copy, you know, they were obviously parents and they were, yeah, this is great. And dad, dad said, it, I was such an easy read. And then my mom said, it actually wasn't an easy read. And I thought, oh, is it confusing? Did it not flow? And she goes, it's not easy because you might see yourself in some of the situations. So so what I would tell people is that as you're reading it, to give yourself permission to see things that might be uncomfortable, that see things that you might not see. And, And again, when we can, I really believe that when we can see things differently, we can do differently. And so if there's some discomfort there, that actually means you're, you're dancing in the right place. Because otherwise, if we're just pointing fingers at everyone else, right, that's not where change is going to happen. So I, 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 I hope that people feel heart and they feel held and they also feel pushed um, in this book to be able to, to step into a new, new way of being for themselves and for the people in their world. Well, I think that's absolutely doable, my friend. At least it was for me. Of course, I went in thinking it was everybody else. And then I was like, oh, crap, I do that yep. too, right? I mean, yeah. Sometimes I go back and reread it and I was like, mm, <laughs> I think I need to take this yeah. lesson. I, I see like there. t-shirts or, you know, those popsicle sticks in the meeting. You can hold up which elephant is going on right now. You know, I got all kinds of ideas for you. For oh, I love it. Stuff. Okay, so last thing I want to say is I want to give you a chance to make sure people know how to find you. I mean, yeah. I found you on LinkedIn, but what is your um, invitation for folks who want to follow your work or know more about this? Yeah, you can connect with my colleagues and I at sarahnollwilson.com. The company has my name, but the 
team has grown and is bigger than me. Uh, my DMs are always open on social media. You can get the book wherever copies are sold and not announced yet, but the audio book just launched. And so we'll be promoting that. So now is a good time that if you want to hear me reading it is available for purchase. Oh, that's awesome. You have such a great voice. I'm so excited it's you and not some random person who I don't connect with. Okay, so funny you. story about that. So thank you, yeah. thank you. Um, my publisher was like, no, we don't want, we don't typically recommend authors read their own books because they don't understand voiceover work. And I said, does it make you feel better knowing that I'm a classically trained actor who did professional voiceover work for a number of years and is really good friends with the local studio in town? And they're like, okay, that's fine. That's awesome. <laughs> right. Way to advocate for yourself, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I was just, yeah no, that Brene. was a non-negotiable for that's me. That's awesome. Yeah. I listened to Brene Brown one time and it was some other voice. I'm like, this is, yeah. I, it's not the same experience. Right. Yeah. And nothing right. against the other voice. I just mm -hmm. wanted, yeah. I think I want it works the, really well with fiction. Yeah. I think fiction works really well. But yeah. especially when it's a known entity, but, but also. But your storytelling you and your it. voice. Exactly. It's, it's yeah. gonna, I can't wait. I can't wait to listen to it. Well, thank you for spending this beautiful amount of time with me. I feel, I feel honored. I'm inspired. I am grateful. Uh, I think that all of our listeners, there's going to be so many good juicy nuggets in here that are practical and actionable that you know, I didn't go over every chapter, but I definitely highlighted some things to pique some curiosity. Um, and thank you for birthing this, gestating and birthing this gift to the world. Here it comes again. Don't feed the elephants. Everybody go get that today. Sarah, thank you for your time today. I'm so glad you spent your time with me. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, we'll talk soon. Okay.